Well, here we are getting ready to do a Bible timeline. Some of you may not know what that means, but a Bible timeline is where you go back from the very beginning of eternity. And we're going to talk about God first. God, or Yahweh, is his name, his most holy name. He manifests himself in three ways. The Father, which is the heart of God. The Son, which is the word of God that come and lived among us and showed us the way. And the Holy Spirit of God, which is the one that he gave us, the promise at the end of the age of law and Jesus lived on earth and taught us the way. When he arose from the grave and he was going to heaven, he promised us the Holy Spirit would live in us. But all the time before that, the Holy Spirit came down on people at certain times as God spoke to people and went back. But now in the church age that we're now living in, he lives in our heart if we're a believer and have a committed ourself to him and ask forgiveness of our sins, of course. So anyway, we're going to talk to you about this a little bit. And uh, just for a minute, I'm going to let you know who you're talking to. Okay. And here I am. And anyway, my heart has been for some time to understand the story of God from the beginning to the new heaven and new earth, really. And so about... It, it's on here. It says it was uh, actually March 13th of 1980. I had seen a timeline chart in a bookstore somewhere, a small one, and I had also seen John Hagee talking about it in his church service, and he had a beautiful illustration of it, but it was still not right down to the science like I wanted to see. So I took this big 15-foot piece of paper and, I, and four foot tall, and I just, I just decided I was going to pencil everything in across the timeline. And that's what I did. So that's what you're going to see today. And it's going to tie in to the book that I'm writing. And hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have it ready to publish. Um, it'd be a nice New Year present uh, in January, hopefully. But uh, it's called Yahweh, Not My Way. So here we go. I'm going to reverse this now, and we're going to go through this shortly. All right, so it all started here with God in heaven, all the angels of the Lord worshiping him, and it was a, a awesome time, I'm sure, you know, because Lucifer was the great choir director in heaven that they say was the most beautiful angel. So there's references of that. If you want to follow and note this, I'll be quick, though. Isaiah 14, 12, and Ezekiel 28, 17. He was called the son of the morning. And during that time, you might say the earth itself was formless and void. And before that, we don't know. So I listed that here as prehistoric time because I don't know the answer there's no science to prove it. So I just put, this is the time before there were records kept. So that settles that with people that want to argue with you. <laughs> but creation itself happened right here. And it was in um, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. And then Isaiah 45, 18 also talks about it. So if you miss this, you can have the video and you can see it and follow, go back and follow a little more with it. But anyway, so this line that's here marks the uh, actually the um, first history of humanity. And in that, the first age of man, which some people might call that an age of man or a dispensation, many have different opinions. But remember in the Bible, it says that a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So here, just for a minute, I actually wrote it on here that uh, dispensations of the Bible, history, whatever, and I also wrote on there that it's the uh, the Bible verse is Second Peter three eight through ten, 
with the Lord a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Okay. Anyway, so I'm going to back out a little bit so I don't move this around too much on you. And I'll just give you some verses as I talk. But the first dispensation is the age where man was in the garden. He created Adam. He created Eve. He created all the, the trees and the flowers and the sea creatures and the birds in the air and everything. And um, we know that in that period of time is where he said on the seventh day he rested. That was all during the age of innocence, okay? And right before that time, though, I want you to think about it because up here, God said that he kicked Satan out because Satan wanted to be God. So you're going to see here uh, the serpent, Genesis 3.1, was already on the earth and he was going to tempt Adam and Eve. And if you remember, God told them that they were to not eat of one fruit. And you'll see the tree there, the tree of life, uh, of knowledge, you might say. That's in Genesis 2.17. They weren't to eat of that tree. and uh, But, you know, they, they just, for some reason, mankind's been that way all along. And every age of man, you're going to see that there was a law given. Right here you go written right on there. You know, he said, here's your responsibility. Do not eat of that tree. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 and Genesis 2, 15 through 17. But they failed. They ate of it in Genesis 3, 1 and through 6. So there was a judgment, the curse and the death, meaning that man would only live so long from that time and they would also work by the sweat of their brow if you read the rest of the scripture. Uh, it was not going to be easy for them. They were cursed. And so now uh, this, this was when they were, they were going to know and they were going to have knowledge. And right at that point, the Spirit of God looks at Adam and he says, where are you, Adam? And Adam was embarrassed. He didn't want to see God because he knew he had sinned when Eve ate of the tree and then Adam followed suit. Well. That's when also during that time period is when you hear about the story going into the second age of mankind here because this is the timeline where it's going to switch, see? So we're coming into the age of consciousness now. They know sin, right? So the first sin is Cain killed his brother Abel right here, see? Killed his brother Abel. And why? Because of jealousy, hateful. You know, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and pride are the three sins that are mentioned in the Bible that probably you could say everything is somewhere around those three sins. Every sin in the world has something to do with those three sins. And during this time, again, there was a responsibility. Do good and have blood sacrifices now because of the first sin was blood, and God now wanted, since there was blood spilt, you had to have a blood sacrifice. In Genesis 3, 5, verse 7, 22, and then also chapter 4, verse 4. So the failure was their own wickedness, and God judges them according to Genesis 6, 5. And the judgment was universal flood. Isn't that something? So during this age of consciousness, which was about a 1,650-year time period. We, we know that in the age of innocence, it's no recorded years. We don't have years that, that I know of, and I haven't heard of anybody else telling about it. So uh, we can't say how many years was there, but there was about 1,650 years during the age of consciousness. Consciousness naturally meaning we know sin. So when you're an age of accountability at a certain age and, and you're in sin, then you're going to have to pay for that sin. And that's why uh, when, when it got so bad and God seen already in the second age that man was going to do what they wanted to do and not what he told them to do. And you remember in the New Testament where it tells us, and also in Joe 2 it tells us, uh, that man was so sinful that God had to destroy 
the earth by flood. Well, what were what was the sin? Well, we read in Joe 2 where it says that the sin, or well, in the New Testament, I'm sorry, we read where they're talking about this was the same as the day of Noah. And the day of Noah was when they were sinning and lusting, doing things wrong, just like we are today. Okay? So it's no different today. In the church age, and you hear that preached every once in a while, somebody will speak about it, but there's no difference than there was right then in the day of Noah. Now remember, there's only been maybe 1,600 to 2,000 years that has taken place in this time period. And already God is so furious because he gave him a perfect garden to live in. We didn't have to worry about sin. We didn't have to worry about dying or anything else. A perfect life. But man had to do it his way. And then what did he do? He lived in sin in the second dispensation of time during the age of consciousness. So God was so fed up. Think about how bad this would have to be that the creator of man destroyed man and the animals, all except the two of each species, not necessarily of each uh, type of bird, for example, but a species. And, and, the, and then Noah, his wife, and his sons and their wives. That's all that entered the boat. And the rest of the people were caught in the flood. They made fun of Noah for 40 years while he was building that ark. Can you imagine? Just like they made fun of Jesus, the Son of God here on earth. They made fun and laughed at him and mocked. But you know, there is a day they pay, right? In the ark, it was the closing of the door that the rest of the people were lost in sin. As you're going to see at the end of the age of grace, it's going to be something else that happens. And man will be under tribulation and suffer. And then there'll be another great time, the day of judgment, where the final door will close. So Noah's ark and that door closing was symbolic of what's here to happen soon and at the end of the millennium. Again, so we're going to move on now. So at the time the flood occurred, then we move into the third dispensation of man. And in that third dispensation of man, that's called the age of human government. And man decides that he thinks he knows it all again. You know, Noah had uh, three sons, Ham, Sham, and Jepheth, and they were supposed to scatter, and they didn't. You know, it's supposed to have been that Sham went to the Middle East, Ham went to the African nations, as we know it, and Jepheth would go into the European nations. Eventually they do. But during this time, they failed. And man builds this tower thinking that they're going to find God. They're going to build a tower to get to God. So God confused their languages. And the Tower of Babel represents that. That tower they were building well, the reason they call it the Tower of Babel, Babel means the confusion of, you know, different languages. It's different languages. So they didn't understand each other. Okay? So in that time period, there was a responsibility again. And the responsibility this time was to multiply and to scatter throughout the earth. Genesis eight fifteen and 9, 7. Failure, they didn't scatter. Genesis 11, 1 through 4. So the judgment was confusion of the languages. See, we cannot fool God. During that period, that dispensation, that was about 427 years it took place. And I want to show you something else here. You see these colors here where you see lines coming down and across and everything? I want you to see that now and then you'll understand later. The orange line is the Father. And the Father come down with the Son and the Holy Ghost, and they created. That was Genesis 1. So the world that was formless and void now becomes a, an earth that we understand now. Okay, then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all went back up. You see that? All three. So the, the orange line is the Father. The dotted line then would be the Son. And the blue solid line is the Holy Spirit. And then the red line, of course, that's important. Lucifer fell, right? 
and he's represented as a snake here in the Age of Innocent. He's represented as the liar here, that red line going all the way across through eternity. That's Satan, okay? And that's what he's here to do. He's here to confuse, well, kill, steal, and destroy, right? <laughs> okay, so anyway, now you know the line coming down this blue is where the Holy Spirit keeps coming down on man as God speaks through man to tell him what to do. So in this age of human government, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within uh, certain believers for certain times, you know, or from time to time, you might say. And when they failed and God was angry again, he confused their language. So now we're ending the third age or the third dispensation of man. And remember again, as I'm going through here, just keep it in mind, a dispensation is a period of time that's not necessarily a certain amount of years. Ages, the same way, an age of man, age of this, age of that. It could be a number of years, uh, and it can vary. And that's what's happening through the Word of God, different timelines. But in this third uh, stage of mankind, just remember, we think that was a long time ago, and all of this has taken forever. But God looks at it and says, no, it's not. A day, again, remember? A day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So in my understanding, that's God trying to tell us, hey, it's not been that long for me. You know, I, I don't think about time like you folks do. You know, you might think it's important every time you go uh, to bed at night, and then you get up, and you go through the day, and 24 hours passes. You go back to bed, and you keep doing that. But God is always there. Probably, I would say God is always awake. <laughs> He's, he always knows because somewhere in the world there's sunshine going when we're asleep, right? And God is always awake. He's God. Don't try to figure it out. You never will. There's some things we have to trust by faith. If somebody can't receive God by faith, they will never find salvation. Amen? Anyway, we now enter into the fourth dispensation or age or again the day, whatever. And this period, they claim, is about 430 to 600 years into history, okay? So it's called the Age of Promise. The reason is because God promises Abraham that he will become the father of many, many nations, okay? And we have songs about Father Abraham, you know, things like that. And it's all pointing to that and telling that story. But Abraham had a son, Isaac. And during this time, when we were in the age of promise, Isaac was with him as they went up a mountain at a given time here. And they went up this mountain finding a sacrifice. Remember, they're always sacrificing. That bloodline is there. They have to sacrifice. Jesus Christ become our final blood sacrifice. They didn't have that. They had to have an animal sacrifice every year. So there was an occasion when Abraham is taking his son up the mountain to sacrifice on an altar. And they always had a ram. And usually they'd carry that like over their shoulder and the other one would carry the kindling. And they'd go up to the top. Well, this time he couldn't find the ram. So he trusted God to go on up the, the mountain. But eventually it occurred. And, you know, however you want to interpret that, you can read the scripture for yourself and you'll find out. But the bottom line of that is they had a responsibility. They were to dwell in Cana, and, and they didn't do that. And Abraham was a faithful man. He was the one that he was going to go up that mountain regardless and wait and see where the ram is. Well, when it didn't show up, his son and him both started thinking, well, maybe he is a sacrifice. And that's exactly what happened. So Abraham lays his son on the altar puts the kindling down, binds him, and he's ready to take a knife to kill his son and then burn burn him. And boy, that's a hard thing for me to even believe, you know, they would do. But he had that kind of faith in God. And sure enough, an angel of the Lord told him to stay the knife. Do not kill your son. And at the same time, you would have heard a ram in the bush or as the I know the King James Bible says caught in a thicket, but it's no more than a bush. 
the horn of the ram was caught in that bush. And that ram would have been crying. Ah! And they heard him and then thank God. Now you can imagine the, uh, the, the, what, the relief, you might say, of what they felt at that time. Because, wow, I don't have to take my son's life. I wanted to be obedient to you, God, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And his son is saying, oh, my goodness, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, you know. So by that faithfulness, God used Abraham during this time uh, tremendously, and the nation grew a lot. But at the end of this time period, the people, because they failed, you know, it says here they were to dwell. That was the responsibility to dwell in Canaan. That's Genesis 12. Well, they failed. God, and they ended up ended up in Egypt. So <laughs> they dwell in Egypt. That's Genesis 12, 10, and also 46 through 16 are key verses and key chapters there, okay? So Genesis 12, 10 through 46, 6. But the judgment was Egyptian bondage, and now you're into Exodus. Chapter 1, 8 through 14, especially. And when they were in that bondage, you remember a lot of the stories, and I don't have time to tell it. I'm just giving you the timeline. <clears throat> but that's when uh, Moses then was told, right at the end of this dispensation of time, that's when Moses was told to tell the people uh, of Egypt, the Pharaoh, to let his people go. They were enslaved by the Egyptians. Now God says, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let your people go. And there was like 10 plagues on them. And every time the plague, it was pretty awesome. If you read about it, it was really awesome. But every time there was a plague, the Pharaoh denied it. Until then he said, okay, the firstborn of every uh, family is going to die. And so the Pharaoh kind of laughed at him, I guess, at first. But then God told all the Egypt or all the Israelites to put the blood sacrifice over their doorpost. Again, blood was used. And the angel of death would pass by. Well, that's what made the Pharaoh finally let him go because when he saw that his son had died and he was really furious, but he knew that they had to get this God away from his people, and so get Moses to take his people out of there so they would stop finding judgment. And they did. So they gave him silver and gold and everything, and they left with over a million people, and they start to the Red Sea, and this is where the fifth dispensation starts at the Red Sea. The Holy Spirit had come down again, you know, and was there with Moses, directed him. But the people were so... They were whining all the time. They'd never listened to anything. They didn't want to obey him, and they were tired of waiting, and they would complain all the time. So as they complained, God just let them wander in the desert. How long? Forty years. Forty becomes kind of important a lot of times in the Bible. You know, it was 40 days and nights that it flooded. There was 40 years that Noah built the ark. Now here we are. The, these guys wander in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> and then they come to the Red Sea. And now they're complaining because they see that they can't cross the Red Sea, right? You all know the story. So that's where God performed another phenomenal miracle. Holy Spirit comes down. An amazing thing happens. And they see it for themselves that God is parting the water so they can go through. Isn't that, I mean, how can, yeah, that's hard for me to even imagine, you know? But that's what happened. So that's where our faith has to rest and understand that we can't see everything. We don't know everything, but I want to give you a good picture so that you get a picture of why we're here where we are and what's coming, okay? And we're getting awfully close to the most important part. So I think we've been in this about 20 minutes or so, 24 minutes. All right, so the age of law comes into being. That's the fifth dispensation. It lasts about 1,500 years. And when the law was given on Mount Sinai, this is pretty important. Before the law was given, the Lord told Moses 
that he was to go and and be on the, uh, Mount Sinai, and, and the Lord would come in the cloud and meet him. But he also told him, for three days, I want your people to cleanse herself and be ready to meet us there around the mountain. And so at the end of the three days, they come to the mountain, and all of a sudden, they hear this powerful sound, which is the voice of God coming through the cloud as a shofar. So it, it's a little more powerful if you understand the shofar, okay? So I want you to hear the shofar, because <laughs> it would have been a lot louder than this, but I'm just going to blow it for a second, okay? Now, it said when it waxed louder and louder and louder, then <laughs> the earth quaked. Imagine this. The earth quaked, the sky darkened, and the people were trembling in fear. I mean, come on, you know you would. It'd be a terrible time to, to hear that sound. It would be a whole lot louder than me blowing this horn. And hearing the earth actually quaking and shaking and, and hear thunder that would be so powerful. And, and I can't even begin to dramatize. If you ever seen the Ten Commandments, you might get a picture of it, okay? <laughs> that might be one way to find out. Anyway, during this time, Moses gets the commandments. And the people are down below, and they're complaining. Well, he's still up there, and he hasn't come down yet. And I'm just giving the highlights. So, but it ends up that when he comes down, the people have already gotten so impatient, they take all the gold and silver and build that fatted calf made out of gold. So what an abomination. So God divided the people, and he said, if you're with me, come on this side with Moses. And if you're not, go on the other side. And when he scattered them, he split the earth right down the middle between them, and he swallowed up all of them that would not obey and say they would come with Moses. So that destroyed a lot of those people right there that uh, uh, we know had already been in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> but anyway, going on here quickly, uh, or I'm going to mess everything up. i got to stick with the word here, what I'm trying to do. Uh, we know that there was still blood sacrifices. You had the Passover and the Passover lamb. Uh, you had the Passover of the, the uh, Holy Spirit saying that he would come and the people that had the uh, blood sacrifice over the door, right? That they were going to be, their child would be saved. Now you're coming into where there's going to be sacrifice all the time in the tabernacle and then eventually in the temples. And the prince of the world is still there, and he's fighting everything he can. And the nation is divided by the year 925 B.C., look in 1 Kings 12. And here was the responsibility that they were supposed to do again. The responsibility was keep all the law, the Ten Commandments, right? Exodus 19, 3 through 8. Failure, they broke the law. They rejected Christ because by the end of this time, you can see the picture here. Jesus comes down, the dotted line, right? And he lives 33 years. And he preaches and they rejected him. So when they rejected him, and this is told in both 2 Kings 17 and again in Matthew 27, 1 through 25. Then the judgment was the, the world become, uh, it was a worldwide uh, de deception, you might say. And Deuteronomy 28, 63 through 66, and Luke 21, 20 through 24 tell about this story. So there was desperation all over the world, and the people uh, would not even listen because here comes Jesus, he's born. And they don't believe that, you know, they don't want to believe he's the son of God. You know that story. But here he is. He's living here. And he's baptized with the Holy Spirit. Remember, John baptized Jesus. 
And then he ends, he enters at one point, he enters Jerusalem on a donkey as their king. But the people want him to be the king forever, and that wasn't the plan. The plan was the final blood sacrifice would take place. That's why it says it is finished on the cross. The blood, the lamb sacrifice. Jesus Christ died for our sins. John 5.22, John 7.30, and so many other verses. Your favorite one, probably John 3.16. But all that time, think he was teaching them. He was, he was seeing people healed and delivered and everything, and people still turned on him. And the, sac the uh, Sadducees and Pharisees wanted him dead. So they ended up, they got their way, didn't they? And again, they failed God, you might say. So failing God is not really a good, good idea, but <laughs> we'll, we'll find that out here soon. But they did, so what happens? Jesus has the Last Supper, and he tells them that he will be leaving, and he, he gives them the communion, and they, they really don't want to see that happen. You got one of them that turns on him because, you, let's face it, Judas wanted Jesus to be the king right there. That's all it was. He just wanted him to be king. So he thought he'd force it on him. So he turned him in and received coins. And then later, uh, when they went to Gethsemane, and he realized what he was doing, and he saw that Jesus was going to die on the cross, he ended up, he hung himself. He threw their silver coins in that back, but he hung himself over it. So I don't know about him, but I know all the rest of the disciples. We know the story that during this time, uh, they were out there spreading the gospel after Jesus ascended into heaven, and every one of them were killed. Every one of them died by some torture of some kind. So, you know, we're, we're fortunate today that we don't necessarily have to die for our faith, but boy, so many people are not living for their faith. They have a head knowledge, they have a form of belief and deny the power, and they're afraid to even tell their testimony to people and, and to be able to tell people how to get to Jesus, you know, how to come to he heaven. They don't, they don't even know how to say it. They'll tell you, oh, I don't know how, or I'm not a preacher. But every one of us are preachers of the word. Every one of us should be telling about the gospel. So here we are, the sixth dispensation of man, and at this point, we're at year 2021, so we know that uh, it says that by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove that you're my disciples. He told us that, but we're living in this church age, and see, he went up, but he gave us the Holy Spirit to live in us, right? So we're supposed to be following what the Holy Spirit is guiding us to do. And we're still not getting it. No one in the Old Testament period of time had the Holy Spirit living in them all the time. They just had the Spirit come down on certain prophets or people that, that wrote the scriptures. That's all. But now, here we're living in this age where every person who really is believing God for their salvation has got the Holy Spirit to guide them. And he does talk to us. You should know that, right? Okay, so anyway. During this time, there's also a green line, if you see it, and that green line that was going across there, I forgot to tell you, that's man. That's man on earth going through his struggles, right? And so man all the way through a certain period here where we're going to leave too if we're truly believers. The unbelievers will live on, but there's going to be a great fall in Jerusalem. We talk here in, in this section, uh, some of the things that are critical to, to say is, it says that in A.D. 33, roughly, that's when Paul had a conversion, become a missionary, and he spread the word of Christianity all over Rome and Asia Minor. He ended up writing 16 letters in the Bible. That's pretty powerful. He spoke in Rome and Turkey and all that area. And uh, there was a, a lot of desperation in Israel at that time. Ezekiel 36, 16 through 19 talks about it. Um, the responsibility during the age of grace, the church age, you might say, the responsibility was to live by faith, receive Christ, be led by the Holy Spirit. John 1, 12, 
Romans 8, 1 through 14. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. That tells you a lot. The failure is people would reject Christ and trust their own works that they could be good enough. And I hear it all the time. I ask people what they trust in. Well, I'm a good person. I should go to heaven because, you know, I go to church and I give my money and I'm a good person. And, and no one is good enough to get to heaven on their own. It's only by the grace of God. So anyway, the judgment that's going to take place here is the great tribulation is going to come. And it's going to be a terrible time. If you want to read it, read Matthew 24, 21, and then read Revelation 6, 15 through 17. So here's what's happening right now. This is important to get this, okay? Highly important because what's going to happen right away, I got this, uh, I'm in the camera view with my light behind me. Sorry. Up here it says, um, <clears throat> <laughs> everyone needs to believe in, in the verses in the New Testament that relates to the second coming. And there's 300 prophets of the Old Testament to talk about the first coming. And then that's when Jesus came as a babe. There's 500 prophecies about the second coming. Can you imagine that? Okay, well, <laughs> the time when Jesus goes up, and then we, we're living here on earth, we're getting the word, and we're going to the churches and all that, and then all of a sudden, the body of Christ is going to be taken up, and the unbelievers are going to continue living on down here on earth, okay? And that is not the second coming yet, okay? That is the rapture. The second coming happens later. This says Christ's second coming for saints, but this is really an error because it's over here. But what it is, is it's a reminder that many people think that's the second coming. It's really just a taking away. It's the time that the church is taken up in the air to meet the Lord. It says there'll be a marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, we receive our new heavenly bodies, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And there's uh, seven years of tribulation from Revelation 19, 7 through 9, and 2 Corinthians 5, 10. But this is a time when we're taken up to be with the Lord, that the believers are judged and receive rewards for what we've done on earth. Some will receive several. Some may not receive many. And we don't know everything. We just have to take it what we do know. That's what we do know, okay? But while we're up there, the seven years of tribulation will be split in half. And there'll be a time where 144,000 Jewish evangelists in three and a half years will be preaching the gospel. It's found in Revelation 11. Then there'll be the two witnesses, the two prophets, which is assumed it's Elijah and Elisha. And they will be killed and come back to life. That'll be powerful. <laughs> but uh, tribulation also records in Matthew 24, 21 through 22, the Antichrist, and in Daniel 11, 21 through 24, also in, a, in the false prophet. So they will take over the earth. People will follow them because they don't know what to think. Remember, when you find a bunch of people taken up and they're not here. Maybe they went to bed at night and they they were missing. Maybe they left for work and you never see them again. Can you imagine if they were in an airplane and all of a sudden just a bunch of passengers left the plane? Maybe the pilot left the plane. There's going to be a lot of things that the news media is going to be talking about and it won't be politics. So remember that. <laughs> okay. So anyway, let's move on because I could talk all day on this. Uh, Revelation 13, 15, and 20, verses 4, talks about the regathering of Israel during this time. And Ezekiel 36, 20 through 24 also does. So they will gather together, and they will be preaching the gospel. And they'll have to lose their life. Most Christians and believers will die because they are sticking up for 
what they believe. And we know there's some scripture that talks about the mark of the beast. So more than likely it will be that if they don't take that mark, and that could be anything today, think about it. We already have credit cards with all kinds of markings on them, and they'll make it easier and put it on your hand or your forehead. And those who are not willing to deny the Lord will not be able to eat or buy. So I think most of you can relate to that being very likely to happen. Well, at the end of this tribulation period, seven years, we're going to find the time of Armageddon that they talk about in the Bible is taking place. That's Revelation 16, 16, and 19, 11 through 21. And that is when, if God wouldn't have sent the Lord Jesus Christ back, then the people would have destroyed their self because the world would have been in so much chaos and all the fighting that goes on, it's already started, you know that, it makes us wonder how short the time is for all of this, really. But anyway, in that day, if they wouldn't have been stopped by the Lord coming back, the second coming of Christ, right here, okay, second coming, if they wouldn't have been stopped, they would have destroyed themselves. But he interacts, Christ comes with the believers who have been with him in heaven, in our new bodies, and Satan is taken out. Satan is cast into this bottomless pit. We're now in the, just let me move this. <laughs> We're now in the seventh dispensation of time, okay? Seventh age. The kingdom age is called. And this is where they talk about the restoration of Israel, and there will be a temple built at some point there. That's where supposedly the Lord, when he comes back down, that's where he will reign. That will be his uh, center of pla the place where he will be in Jerusalem. So they say that the temple will be built and placed where the, uh, or either right next to it, where the uh, Dome of the Rock is on Temple Mount. But it's immaterial to us. It's going to happen. That's all we have to know. Okay, we don't have to know everything. And um, Christ is now going to be king of kings and reign with sinless men. Why? Because at that time, Satan has been taken out. Satan has been put into the bottomless pit or the abyss, or some call it Hades, along with the unbelievers. See, all the unbelievers here, they die during this tribulation, and they're taken out along with Satan, right? So now the only ones that are living here are the believers that came back and the ones who died during that time. If you remember, they've died and they were believers. They died for the, they were martyred for their faith. And then all the other believers that have died since time that God honored in their belief, they will be here. So that's a, it's like a spiritual being. You got to understand will be new bodies, a new way of thinking, a new way of living. And the Satan will not be there to tempt you. So nobody can blame Satan for anything. So a thousand years to me is the seventh dispensation, they say, is a thousand years. So that should be, and it's called a millennium, that should be about between 10 and 20 generations of people, however you want to look at that. And it says that by the end of that time, the children of the believers, right here, the children of the believers will turn away. See? They will turn away from God. All right? And the, during this time, it says here that the responsibility, I'm trying to let you see it, not just say it, is to obey and worship the Lord. That's uh, given to us in Isaiah 11, 20, 11, 3, verse 3 and 5, I mean. And then also in Ezekiel 14, 9 through 16. But, the problem is we failed. The final rebellion takes place. By Revelation 20, 7 through 9, those children of those believers during the millennium do not obey. Wow. So the judgment is eternal hell. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Isn't that something? Now, keep in mind, I think you know it by now. I did this in 1980. And I'm 77 now, so, you know, I was fairly young, but I was learning the scriptures, 
trying to piece this together so I could understand and then teach it in Bible classes, which I did. And now I'm putting it back out because my book is all about this. The book called Yahweh, Not My Way is bringing us to understand how much we failed God and how much he's given us opportunities over and over and over. But now here we are, and this is terrible, but now we're at the time of the final. It's, it's terrible, I and mean, it really is. This is the great white throne judgment. Now, the believers are safe because, remember, the believers already were raptured, and the ones who died in Christ, they're going to be uh, here. They're going to be found in the book of life. The book's open right there. The book's open, right? The believers are found in the book of life and the ones who came back with the Lord. So here the believers are watching on and they're on their way to the new heaven. But the great white throne judgment is for the, the people who were unbelievers and all the unbelievers that lived during the millennium and all the unbelievers from all the past clear back from the beginning of time and the devil and his angels come up to this white throne judgment. And what happens? It says that they are all cast out, Satan and all the unbelievers judged, and they end up in the lake of fire. Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all the unbelievers. It's all in the scriptures, folks. So what's happening here? This would be, you might say, a new beginning. I just wrote that on there the other day quickly. A new beginning would be like the eighth day. It would be a, a new week. Uh, eight always means a new beginning, though. But this is the time that everything is redone. All the believe, all the unbelievers are dead and in the lake of fire. But all of the ones who are saints go to the holy heaven, and God burns the earth as we know it. First John two seventeen is a key verse, but it says in Revelation twenty one that God is actually can, he's making a new earth. And a new heaven. So now the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are back together, and we are in His kingdom. Now, whatever that means to you folks, it means we're going to be eternally with God. When it talks about streets of gold or everybody will have a mansion, whatever, I don't care what that means. I just know I'll be living in a spiritual way where I will not be suffering death and hell. So if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, I have nothing to worry about. I didn't lose a thing, right? I just die and that's it. But if I'm right, and anybody that watches this video or anybody you know is wrong, this is going to be a terrible thing to end up in the lake of fire. Amen? So anyway, that's it. And I want to tell you, there's, there's all kinds of things where you can go to, like down here on the floor, there's a timeline. It's got everything in there. I mean, the history of the, the, the blood line, the people, and the kings, and everybody's there. And I have two more books like that. I even have a, a another one that talks about just Israel. But people can get their hands on this stuff if you'll just, uh, if you have enough interest, let's say you go to the Ark Encounter in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, that's, well, it's really northern Kentucky. I'm sorry, Kentucky. <laughs> I think in northern Kentucky. Uh, I think it's Cincinnati. But the bottom line is I've been there and I love to send people there and I like to go back because Ken Ham founded Answers in Genesis and Answers in Genesis become a storehouse of knowledge for creation. So he created a building and they call it the Creation Museum. And in that Creation Museum, they got so much history, so many things. It's so powerful. But then about three, four years ago, they built an ark. And the Amish actually built the ark for him with some other labor and help. But that ark is three stories high. It is so big. It's the original size of the ark mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> so I hope you guys will understand that if you can't go there, get the material if you need to. But there's all kinds of material through Answers in Genesis. And there's other organizations, too, that give you timelines. Because if you're like me, I could sit in a building and listen to professors till I was blue and wouldn't learn a thing. It's not the way I learn. But by showing and telling, as we did today, I learned the most. And by doing it over and over again, I'm getting better all the time. But I admit, I'm not your perfect teacher. I don't think I did the best job. 
but I did what's in my heart. I gave you the best that I could for you to contemplate this is real and God is real and he's waiting for you. If you've never met him as your Savior and Lord, do it today. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to please teach you all that you need to know how to follow him and he'll do it. If you need healing in your body, ask him, call on the Lord and you will be healed either instantly, a little bit at a time, or you'll be healed into heaven, <laughs> in a death in heaven is a great place to be, right? Okay, we've been 50 minutes, and I know that's a long time for some, but I hope somebody got something out of this. And if you didn't, at least I did, because I learned again, and I will be speaking in the morning on a prayer call uh, that will be uh, many people from different parts of the country, and we pray for about an hour, and then we actually pray individually for each other's needs, but I will be speaking to this same thing just on a prayer call, which is not live, but I mean, it's not a video call, but I'm going to be doing a shorter version of it. So uh, I'm praying for myself right now. Lord, please help me do a good job tomorrow. <laughs> okay. And God bless you all. And hey, have a great forever. God loves you. Amen.